Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and thank you very much for having me here. I'm, I'm going to sort of crack a very unwise joke, but just to say, in, in 2006, I was at a, a, a Campbell Colloquium conference, um, and I was one of three presenters, and there were three people in the room. So four people in the room, and halfway, one of them left, so there were three people there. <laughs> So I, I'm really, really pleased there are that many of you here today. And, and I think that just says something either for how fantastic we are as speakers, very unlikely, uh, or how there is a sort of increasing interest in sort of realist research. And I think Nick has set the grounds out extremely clearly. Uh, and, and I will now sort of illustrate and hopefully not completely bastardize an example, uh, which, which I helped some colleagues with up at the University of Kiel. Um, I, I've deliberately not chosen a health example because the rest of the time I, I, I work as a GP and I can't stay overnight because I've got a clinic tomorrow and then I've got a terrible meeting regarding policy work and the, the CCG and things. Um, so the project that, uh, that, that Nick was talking about is, is the Ramses project funded by, you know, BOO, the NIHR and not the ESRC, but there, regardless of that. Um, so the first project was the Ramses 1 project and, and kind of Joanne's going to speak a little bit about that. So that's the, the sort of approach which is realist review, realist synthesis, exactly the same sort of process, um, uh, but, but, but for, with, with sort of um, um, second, as a form of secondary research. And then the one that I'm going to sort of cover is realist evaluation. Uh, it's an ongoing project. We've just released our, our, our reporting standards for that. Um, and that project runs until February 2017. So I've given them a plug. Most importantly, both Joe and I have to write this thing at the bottom, which says anytime we badmouth anybody, it's basically us, not them. We're not talking for anybody else. It's all on my head. And my head of department will like to know, I'm sure. Right, so uh, I'm just going to cover some objectives and then illustrate the value of realist evaluation, uh, points for clarification, and then we kind of move on to Joanne, and then we'll have this sort of big open floor at the end, and or early bar time, whichever way you fancy, really. But, but you know, please feel free to ask us questions. We, we're absolutely delighted to be able to do so. We're not politicians. We will answer them. Right. So by the end of it, the hopefully you'll just have an understanding of the value of wanting to bother to do realist evaluation. Uh, again, another really ter terrible, terrible joke is that sort of realist, or uh, any sort of research methods, you know, they're like noses. That's the sort of polite way of putting it, really. So why would one want to bother? And hopefully we'll be able to give you some idea. I think Nick has laid the, the, the grounds to this already, which is idea of being able to explain context and its relationship to outcome. And also this idea of thinking, well, well, hang on, you know, biggest accusation is, well, how do we know what you've done here in this particular project in this particular set of settings are going to be transferable, certainly in my case, across the, the National Health Service uh, in England, I would say. So I'm not speaking for Scots, similar system in Wales, but different system in Ireland, Northern Ireland, you know, within NHS England. Um, right, so uh, my little diagram, not really to confuse, but just to, again, to illustrate this idea of perhaps this is not a zigzag. I'd like to think maybe this is a sort of virtuous spiral of learning more and more. But if we start off with an evaluation question right at the top there, and then you sort of think, well, Nick did say, well, it kind of determines what, how you would design things. May sound a bit odd, but we'd start off with a, an evaluation question. Design the evaluation initially based on our, you know, super duper best guess, really, or all the expertise that one might have in evaluating. And then we formulate this program theory. So we suddenly come into sort of realist jargon here, but actually it's not realist jargon. Many of you who are evaluators will know of this concept of program theory. Um, um, and, and, you know, we can cover that if you want to later on. So you'd formulate your initial program theory and then potentially end up redesigning the evaluation based on the fact that, whoops, I now need to perhaps pick up a different type of data, uh, which, uh, which I hadn't initially anticipated that I needed to do so. Yeah. Um, so that's that sort of a little, ah, little bit short, that little box there. I uh, should have brought a laser pointer, I haven't got one. Uh, that's on my Christmas list, I think. So <laughs> then one collects the data, does analysis, not tall enough as you can see, refine the program theory, and then we end up back here again, potentially ending up. So this is the sort of, uh, you know, my sort of slight version of the zig and the zag, but
in a bit of a circle. But you can kind of imagine you could zigzag this as a sort of 3D thing out of the wall. And then eventually, where would you end up? Well, I think you end up right up there, exactly. You know, with, with some sort of policy relevant theory to inform commissioning, to inform design of services, etc. But predominantly driven by the fact that we've run out of time uh, or money. Yeah, quite agree with that one. So, so this is the sort of project I'm going to completely misreport, I suspect. So it, it's grades informative work-based assessment, a study of what works for whom uh, and why by uh, my colleagues, as I said, up at the University of Ke at Keele University. Uh, in medical education, I, I sent, you know, this is already a bit of a compromise. Almost everything I talk about is in health because I come from a health background. So I sort of slightly compromised because I know that in the ESRC, many of you are not necessarily in health. So I won't talk about things which might just bore you to death. Right. So the idea here is that, that, that feedback with grades is important to students. Duh. Yeah, it's pretty obvious that. But the paradox is that there is this sort of funny sort of unpredictability to it. Yeah, so that, that's, this is a quote from them. Giving grades as part of feedback to students in school settings and elsewhere in the undergraduate education can reduce the effectiveness of feedback and may reduce student performance. Some of you almost certainly recognize that. And then they said in particular, they end up, the students might, in certain contexts, end up focusing more on the grade than the actual feedback of how they might improve. Yeah, so again, I think that's quite familiar. Um, I, I do do some teaching, so I do kind of understand that. And so they went through the literature and found, you know, great big long list. They reported in their paper that it's an open access paper, by the way. So, you, can, you know, it's not that you have to go through some firewall for it, um, which I think is completely evil. But relationships between sort of the recipient and the giver, the state of mind and maturity of the recipient, so sort of feedback processes, feedback content. These are sort of things they're finding in the literature. So ends of it. It's a great big sort of long laundry list of what it might depend on. Yeah. But you might think, well, that's potentially quite useful. Well, how would you then operationalize that as guidance, for example, when, when you're, you're, you're deliver, deliver, delivering in their, in their case, their educators at, uh, at the med school at, at, at Keele University? Right. So I'm not going to go too much into their design because, again, you can read up about this. So it, it, it's one medical school, yeah? So here's an example of, duh, well, yours is just one medical school with a particular kind of curriculum delivery process, etc. Why in the world would it work at a, another medical school across either the United Kingdom or somewhere else? So it's, it's year three students, so med school students go for five to six years, depending on whether you do an intercalated BSc. But anyway, it's year three students. They have three work-based assessments, they have feedback sessions face-to-face, -face, and then they get graded, yeah? And the way they tried to do this was they had basically students that said, oh, I don't want to be randomized, so they got grade, grade, grade. And then they, the students that did agree to be randomized said, oh, you could go into grade, no grade, and then you could choose, or you could go no grade, grade, and choose. So the idea here was they're trying to understand a little bit about why students choose grades and what they think about them and what they do with them. Um, mixed data collection, quite an interesting one here. Uh, really to get around the problem of people just telling you what you want, potentially want to hear. So they had interviews at exit, I'll show you a little flow diagram later. They have these things called OSCEs, which is obstructed, uh, obstruct, I think they're called obstructive actually. But anyway, it's observed structured clinical examinations. Uh, so steeplechases, that's kind of thing, where you sort of go through endlessly with sort of tutors and fixed scenarios, etc., watching you uh, and actors. And then they had these sort of written summaries. Um, at the end of their workplace assessments. So this is the sort of flow diagram, cut and pasted, no originality here. Uh, just to say, give you some idea about the numbers. So 144 students, they actually can manage to recruit a vast numbers of them, which is really great. Uh, actually, a very small number opted not to be randomized, you know, 24 uh, versus 86. And then those went through, and then they interviewed a, a subsample of them here. That's on the sort of far, your far uh, right, yes. So what did they find? Well, guess what? They were, they were very good, and may, maybe they actually, somebody did actually listen to me for a change. Um, so they tried to build a program theory initially from, from the literature. So you know, I think this again goes back to Nick's point, which is really, it, it's not as if we live in a vacuum. Yeah, there is some data out there. There is quite a bit of knowledge out there. And this is what they were able to come up with as sort of these fragile proto-initial type theories right at the beginning. Here's it. If they, basically, they're saying these are the sorts 
of things we probably want to test. Yeah, and, and they're extremely honest because they stay somewhere. They're really less sure about what they expect to find when they uh, find us the outcome of lower than expected formative grades. So they're saying, well, there are some things we know, but we're not really quite sure what's going to happen when you tell us someone who, you know, completely is head the size of a planet gets told, whoops, I'm sorry, you're really underperforming here, matey. Yeah, so they, they had that bit. And then they had all these other bits there. As you could see, they tried to articulate in the form of context mechanism outcome configurations. Um, and so they've tried to break that down into internal and external, but basically by trying to say, well, which is the sort of context here, which is sort of internal to the person or external, as a sort of external structural thing, or sort of internal, you know, internal mind thinking type thing. Um, so just to give you the, the top one as an example. So what they're basically saying there, if you've got someone you trust who's giving you the, the, um, the, the actual feedback, and then you're one of these pe people who's sort of learning goal approach, you know, you're actually sort of quite mot internally motivated, you want to learn. Right. Uh, and then you'll find the grades will help you to clarify and then give you this thing they call energized. They define it a little bit more in the document as well, in the paper as well. And then his or her efforts to find sort of strategies to improve. That's the outcome that they get, which is they, they feel this sort of drive because it's been clarified because they feel it's given a bit of a sort of push in the right direction. And then the other explanation, they said, if students are more performance orientated, basically they just basically care about what grade they get. Yeah. Um, externally motivated, if you want to call it that, then you will find that satisfactory grades, the sort of thing that they get, basically just says, yeah, 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 you're absolutely fine. Reassures them, I must be doing enough, yeah, uh, and therefore reduces their efforts to improve. Yeah, that's enough. So you can start thinking that's a little bit like those of you who know the jargon, the sort of classic strategic learner just goes, yeah, you know, I just need to get past that. I frankly don't care whether I understand this, that, or whatever. I just need to get past that. Right. So some illustrative examples from their work. So they've got lovely tables to try and explain all of these things. Um, there's some things I've picked out. So I think the top bit there, which is the effects of grades, pretty much confirms that they were able to find some confirmation, some corroboration of their initial program theory about uh, that little, little CMO configuration regarding people who are much more internally motivated. Yeah? So they, they did find some evidence for clarification and also that, that, did, that made them feel, oh my gosh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I should be improving, this is, it makes me feel better. And, and it, it was de deliberately because, I think I've got the wrong O there, I think that M should be an O, but anyway, Sure, they don't read it. Yeah, doctors can't read their own handwriting. In the context of trusted, so then this thing about the trusted, trusted actual assessor, the person who gives them the information that they actually feel they can believe. Uh, an interesting one, I think, is this issue here of how things seem to be context driven. Yeah. So in some people, yeah, the outcome is diminished effort because they become complacent yeah, um, when they get their satisfactory grade. Uh, very much as sort of the, the, the point that they made earlier regarding the sort of very strategic type of person, possibly being too strategic here. Uh, or they may become demoralized. So this is a little bit more information about what happens when you don't quite get the grade you thought you were going to get. Yeah. Um, with the low grade, and this is students sort of, they're, they're, and, and, and they get demoralized by the, real, the, by, by the low grade. But this is in the, in, particularly in the context also sometimes when they get a previous assessment which was which was, I, I guess this then feeds up to the one above, which is that they start to not feel that this is a process that's worth listening to and or the actual person delivering the message is not someone they want to believe or listen to. So they're, they're kind of damaged by the previous assessment. Yep. So there's this, again, this feedback loop, which Nick had a kind of alluded to some extent, that this feedback loop between how previous experience of, of assessments will lead on to people thinking what this, what the value and what sort of importance they place to the assessment. And that leads on to this one down here about how students handle their grade. So they do the process, this process which they call filtering, which sounds as if they just ignore things which they don't like. Yeah, which again is probably pretty human, and I think as Nick has alluded again to earlier, there are probably not that many mechanisms that we possibly all have the ability to have to put on our blinkers as and when we feel like, um, and students certainly seem to do that when they were being shown grades that they weren't happy with. Right. So why bother? Relatively quick now. I don't want to take too much time of Joanne's time uh, or any of your time if you want to head off to the cough for coffee or beer earlier. Um, well, it's not quite five o'clock yet. 
So anyway, it's a move from a list. So basically, you might remember the little list we had, and this is just a cut and paste of that list. Yeah. So relationship between the recipient and the giver. Wow, we've got a little bit more understanding of that now, I hope. So state of mind and maturity of the recipient. Yeah. And then we've got feedback processes, we've got feedback content, all that. So we had this kind of slight long, slightly long laundry list, but the laundry list has now hopefully become a little bit more into these things, sort of context mechanism outcome configurations. So under what circumstances would, for example, the relationship between the recipient and giver be important? So yeah, as I said, if you are interested, tables two and three in the paper is quite good in the way it sort of demonstrates all of these various different configurations. Right, much more nuanced guidance. I'm not going to read all of this. Uh, it, I just put it there because you start seeing the guidance gets a little bit longer, but the idea is that the guidance is a little bit more contextual. Yeah, so just to give me an example, so, so the, the, if it seems that the recipients of grades will enhance the seeking of strategies for improvement, grades should be offered as an element of formative feedback. So a lot of it sometimes does depend on ifs and buts, and this bit initially at the top, which says quite a lot of the time it's quite important to explore what the actual learner is potentially going to do with this, rather than assume there's a sort of one-size-fits-all model of, right, you're all going to get grades, we don't, frankly don't care, have the grade, and you know, off you go. Right, so that's sort of to more nuanced guidance, and then to this sort of potentially transferable bit. They are in no way, and I certainly wouldn't want to put my hand up and say that this is what they're saying, they're in no way saying these are the only mechanisms available, and or these are the mechanisms which are the most important. All they are saying, potentially, is if you are going to investigate this further, and they do say this later on uh, within their paper and discussion section, those are the types of mechanisms which may be important. Yeah? So again, it stops us from reinventing the wheel. Yeah? So um, there is no point in thinking there is nothing that we know, therefore I'm just going to have this completely novel intervention. What they're basically saying is there are potentially these things, these mechanisms which are worth studying within different contexts. So again, it's kind of moved on from less of a laundry list to more nuanced guidance, more transferability because of potential things which are worth exploring. Um, and I virtually finished. So, so realist poachers, I think they help us to unpack the sort of black box. And I think in this case, the black box is one of, you know, what does feedback do and for whom and whatever. And they use this, uh, as Nick has, 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 has explained, this logic of analysis, uh, which is C plus M equals O. Um, and as it's a heuristic, it's not an equation. Yeah, but importantly, it is a configuration. Yeah. And it produces findings that, that do explain, well, it's fairly clear, it does say how context is, it affects an outcome. Um, and, and so that's an important sort of additional bit of added value, if you want to call it that. And then it has this explicit warrant for why knowledge might be transferable from one study or one setting to another, which is just via these mechanisms. But of course, we can all make these assumptions. Doesn't mean they're real, and that doesn't mean they are actually true, but so they do need to be tested in a different, different setting there. Yeah. And that the knowledge produced is partial and cumulative. I think, again, that, uh, no, 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 no claims made by the authors that, that their, their study was you know, the end of it all and nothing else needs doing. Right. So questions for clarification.